On this episode of the Ready State Podcast, we are excited to welcome Dr. Kirk Parsley. Doc Parsley completed SEAL training as a teenager and served on SEAL Team 5 for six years. After leaving to attend college, Kirk received his medical degree and returned to the military as the physician for the West Coast SEAL teams. It was while helping the world's most elite warriors optimize and maintain their performance after years of sustained combat that he noticed a significant gap between healthcare and true health. Kirk was compelled to delve into the extensive alternative medical literature, synthesizing and applying plans that relied minimally on pharmaceuticals, supplements, or gadgets. His unparalleled success led him to become a sought-after medical human performance expert, not only for Navy SEALs, but also for various military special forces commands. Kirk firmly believes that 80% of health is derived from focusing on sleep, nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation, with a strong emphasis on sleep. We should just underline sleep. So you'll hear this, but I got to meet Doc Parsley when I was doing some work with Naval Special Warfare, and he was the physician of record, and he was just starting to uncover what you'll learn to see is one of the dirtiest secrets in professional sports, in the military, and that's Ambien. Yeah, and you know he was really, I think, the first person to come into our world and really show us and... Um, was, you know, the first person really talking in the universe we were in about the importance of sleep and prioritizing sleep in our lives. I think yeah. that was really new information to us. And we gave um, lip service before, like so many yeah. others. Yeah, yeah, sleepy, I sleep great. Yeah, I he was great. really on the tip of the spear of this. And, you know, what, what I loved about this episode was just sort of his, you know, very practical information and backstory about why we should care about sleep. And it doesn't really matter what matters to you. You know, whether it's your hormones or performing well at your job or being smarter or showing up, you know, better for your family. Like, I, I don't know. I've been sleeping. Reasons. My hair hasn't come back, Jay. Well, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if that's going to help. So <laughs> one of the things that I think is is really amazing is that when we and we've talked about this before, but we were on a podcast and I suggested that seven is a minimum, but really eight is the magic. And I got destroyed by people being like, <laughs> nah, you don't destroyed. know. And I literally was like, I'm, am I gaslighting myself? Like, <laughs> and what really nice is Kirk is so clear about saying, hey, it, we've got strategies to get you there, but let's not be apologists. Let's not mess around. Let's not water it down. You have to try to get eight hours of sleep. Yeah, and if you're someone who struggles with insomnia or is curious about what supplements might help you sleep or just generally understanding why we care so much about sleep, yeah. this is definitely the episode for you. It's not long enough. We've probably had three or four or five hours in here, but what I suggest you do after you listen to this is go explore for yourself. Kirk is a great interview. He's so bright. We know you're going to love this one. Kirk, welcome to the Ready State Podcast. Thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. I, I want to set the conversation up for how we know you and why you're so important to us. And just for everyone to understand, I met Dr. Parsley when he was just just in quotation marks, a physician for Naval Special Warfare, <laughs> working in the trenches, trying to we solve the and problems. Was really, that's right. And, and I really just everyone knows you have really are one of my anchors in terms of understanding sleep and, the, and maybe the first person in my universe who said, this is something we really have to investigate. And you were doing that from an office next to the gym. And you were, you literally were, just, you pulled me aside, you opened up a cabinet, and you're like, we've got to change it. This is the dirtiest, dirtiest, darkest secret in high performance activities. So that's, that's how the first time I met you. Can you talk a little bit of how you ended up into that room at that moment, sort of obsessed with sleep? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, as a, as a, well, I guess I'm being presumptive to say it's a good story, but as, as most good stories go, it's completely unexpected how it turns out. So, um, uh, you know, I, I joined, you know, I grew up in rural Texas. I was a terrible student. Uh, after four years of high school, I just become a sophomore, dropped out of high school, joined the military. Uh, I heard about this thing called SEAL training. It's supposed to be the toughest thing in the world. I didn't know what a SEAL was. I just wanted to go to the toughest training in the world. Uh, I, you know, I, I was just 
whatever, typical muscle head young boy, just, you know, full of, full of piss and vinegar and anger and rage and uh, like, you know, wanted to compete and do hard stuff. Um, so, you know, I made it through SEAL training, obviously did six years in the SEAL teams. This was pre 9-11. So it was, you know, we call it the Hollywood SEAL days, you know, because whatever, like we just did a bunch of skydiving and scuba diving and blew, you know, blew things up and got to, you know, drive off road vehicles and stuff. And like, it's kind of like having a life of hobbies. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, met a girl, fell in love, decided, you know, maybe I'll go on and do other things. Uh, it was just, you know, it's kind of getting redundant. You know, I did three deployments, three work trips, three deployments. And that's just kind of like the same training trips, different guys. I said, maybe I'll get out and be an athletic trainer or something. Uh, it's kind of the only thing I knew about was the, you know, I'd read, uh, the girl, the girl I was dating who had become my wife was in, was in PT school. And I used to take her textbooks on deployment and do my best to read them. Like I thought I was reading them, but I, you know, I understood maybe 10% of what I was reading. Um, so like maybe a stretch goal would be a physical therapist, but yeah, that seemed pretty highfalutin, you know, that was at least a master's degree. And I was like, I'm not sure. Um, but as you know, uh, you need 2000 volunteer hours just to apply to PT school. So I'm like, okay, I better start getting my volunteer hours in. So I started working at San Diego sports medicine center. Uh, well, I started volunteering there and then I, I think I was there less than a week and they hired me as a PT aide. Uh, and I worked in that. And then, uh, before they changed the rules, right before they changed the rules, I was able to challenge the test and become a PT assistant. And I, so I, I worked at San Diego sports medicine center the whole time I was in college. Um, and at some point I decided I didn't really want to be a PT. Um, and the doctor, thank goodness. <laughs> and the, and the, and the doctors <laughs> that were there, uh, were only a few years older than me, you know, because they were young docs and, you know, I'd been a steel. And so my, like, you know, the time, you know, the time difference between us was, you know, it's only a couple of years and they're like, you should go to medical school. And I'm like, <laughs> like, yeah, right. You know, pump the brakes, Sparky. I haven't, I didn't graduate high school, you know, uh, I had to start at junior college. <laughs> just to go, you know, just to get into college. So anyway, uh, to make a long story longer, I, uh, I ended up, uh, working there all through college, got, you know, got kind of pressured into going to medical school. Uh, one of the doctors there came out and during this conversation with these young docs, the, the head doctor there, Lee Rice comes out and he said, uh, he said, Kirk, the question isn't, could you get into medical school? The question is, would you want to go if you got in? And I said, of course, I'd want to go if I got in. He's like, well, then kind of, you got to kind of try then, don't you? Right. So, you know, uh, he, 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 po he poked Love my that. ego and I was like, OK, I got to try. So uh, I did well enough to get into medical school. But um, as we were talking earlier, going to date myself here, uh, you know, pre-internet, really. <laughs> you know, I think th there was just like AOL, uh, you know, dial up <laughs> services. Um, and so, you, you know, you go to the bookstore and you get your Kaplan review book and you figure out what schools you're competitive for. And it was during that, uh, you know, looking at my MCAT and my GPA and all that comparing schools, it, looking at that book is when I found out the military had their own medical school. And I was like, oh, wow. I didn't know that. Um, I, you know, I was, I was already married. I already had a kid, I had another kid on the way. Uh, you know, my wife had like $50,000 in debt from PT school. So I was like, they'll pay me to go to medical school instead of the other way around. I can support my family. She doesn't have to work. All right, I'll do it. That sounds yeah. like a great deal. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I'll do it. You know, because you know, the military deal basically they'll they'll train you to do anything, right? But it's a it's a two to one. So four years of medical school is eight years of service, right? Um, and so I was like, well, I'll get back to the SEAL teams, be able to give back to the community. I'll actually make more in training, right? Because when you're you know, when you're resident and fellow, like you hardly make any money at all, but in the military, you're getting paid by your rank and your time. in. so it was like, yeah, it'll, it'll turn out to be a good deal. Um, and so I, I was planning on doing orthopedics. Uh, but the way the Navy works, obviously is you do your first year of residency and then you go out into the fleet, uh, as they call it. And you do like a general practitioner tour. Uh, that's the only way they could get GPs into the you know, keep GPs, having GPs in the military, because otherwise everybody just specialize and, you know, you're not going to send an orthopedic surgeon or something out to work on a ship or something. So, uh, controlled what I could by going to dive school, obviously ended up back at the SEAL teams where you and I met and, you know, the way the military works, just whatever government, big bureaucracy, it takes, uh, it takes about 10 years to get your money for anything. Right. So, 
they had just gotten the money for the tactical athlete program, which I know, Kelly, you're familiar with. Um, and we built our first our first gym and hired our first nutritionist and our first strength and conditioning coach and our first PT and our first athletic trainer. Um, and they put they put me in charge of building that clinic. Like, I supervised the build out of that clinic because of my background and my position in the That's amazing. job. And so then once I had ortho rounds coming through and pain rounds coming through and chiropractor coming through and I had all the PTs and we, you know, you know, the people we got all the people from professional sports teams and Olympic training center. And then we had all these really smart people. Then I was the dumbest, I was then the dumbest guy around. And when you're in the military and you're the dumbest guy, they say, well, you should be in charge. And so I was now the leader and I was supervising all these people. And to your point, you know, we had the, we had the rehab gym and the bridge gym, that little hallway in between there. And my office was there just kind of like, for whatever reason, like wait, I, none of us really knew what I did. And, uh, you know, you know, cause we had a clinic for like sick call stuff and I wasn't that. And then like, I wasn't, I didn't have the expertise of anyone there. So, uh, I was the supervisor, whatever that meant, but what happened, I mean, you, you know, the teams, they don't, they don't trust anybody. The worst thing that you can do is put them on the bench, uh, take them out of their job. You, they'd, they'd rather you kill them. Right. So, they usually lie to their healthcare practitioners, right? They they're forced to go see doctors and get physicals and they just lie and they say, everything's great, man. I feel hundred percent. They do whatever they have to do to pass so that they can stay in their job and they'll spend money out of their own pocket to go see a doctor in town for anything that's really bothering them so that they, they can keep their job. Uh, but because I'd been a seal and I'd been a seal recently enough to where there were still a lot of people there who I trained with and deployed with and who knew me, and so the guys trusted me and they came in and said, you know, come in and shut the door behind them and say, Hey man, just between me and you, I want to tell you what's going on. And they just had this long list of symptoms, uh, which has now been, uh, I, I called, I called it the seal syndrome, seal syndrome in my, uh, lectures. Cause I, I lack imagination and like alliterations. Um, but, uh, they they've subsequently done research to validate everything. And I said, now they call it the operator syndrome and there's a published paper on it. And Chris free just published a book on it. Um, but it's basically, you know, like low libido cognition problems, you know, short term memory, working memory, focus, uh, emotional control, emotional categorization, you know, shifting body negative shifted in body composition, despite doing what everything, you know, everything they know they should do. And difficulty sleeping, which the SEALs never complained about because they didn't value sleep. But when I did their review of systems, they would tell me that they take Ambien. And I'm ashamed to admit how how long it took me. It, it, a lot of guys had been in my office already. Uh, and I honestly had no idea how to fix them. I was a Western trained physician. I knew how to recognize and treat disease. They didn't have diseases. They just weren't performing as well as they would like. But I just started by going... I'm going to test everything I know how to interpret essentially. Right. So I sent them to the hospital. They're getting 23 vials of blood, 98 lab serum markers. And I was just looking to see what I found. Um, and after, you know, 30, 40 guys in the room, you know, come through, told me you mentioned their Ambien. I went and I was like, Oh, I remember putting a note in the margin. And then I went back through my files after he left and every guy who had been in my office was taking Ambien. And I was like, Hmm, I wonder, but again, Western trained physician, I knew nothing about sleep, never had a class on sleep. I didn't know any more than the seals knew. I didn't know any more than my gardener knew. Crazy. And, Crazy. Uh, and you are the director can I just, of this performance Can I just unit. interject in here? Like what, you know, what year are we talking 2009. about? 2009. Like when you sort of discover, 2009, they're all discover they're taking Ambien. Okay. Just yeah. frame it up. Just Thank so you. we're clear, everyone in human performance, that's yesterday. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. And, wow. and so, yeah. uh, Y'all know that when when the pharmaceutical industry applies for a drug approval, they own the research, right? And they they give the FDA what they want to give them, and they don't give them what they don't want to give them, unless they get sued, right? Once they get sued, they have to cough up all the data. So that had just happened with the Z drugs, because guys were getting in their cars and driving to casinos and gambling away their life savings and coming back and getting in bed and not having any memory of it or picking up hookers or people were going down and eating all their kids junk food and getting back in bed and you know thinking somebody <laughs> broke into their house um because it's just a huge dissociative drug um and of course ambient like the people who who all the all the companies that produce z drugs they all knew that they all, like they all knew this happened it was all part of their research trials um 
and you know, I'd been to medical school, obviously I took pharmacology. So I knew that GABA, I knew that, uh, the Z drugs were GABA analogs, meaning they work like GABA, but I had no idea what GABA had to do with sleep. <laughs> I just really like, I'm like, I, I don't know. Like I knew it. I remember a little biochemistry, something about GABA. I don't really know what it does. So of course I had to learn a lot. Once I learned a lot about what happens when you sleep, and then I learned what, you know, what GABA analogs do, whether it's a benzodiazepine or a Z drug. Um, once I learned what those drugs do, I was like, oh, okay, well that, like that could have this effect on sleep and that once, and once I understood, you know, all of and we can go through it if you and your audience want, but like all the stages of sleep and what's going on and all the hormone recalibration, right. That goes on during deep sleep. And I, and the 98 lab markers that I was pulling back was showing, they looked like 50 year old men who are 30 pounds overweight and pre-diabetic, but they were young, you know, 28 to 35 year old seals with six pack abs and, you know, and looked like they're in great shape. Um, wow. and so I, I, uh, I didn't know what was lowering their anabolic hormones, but all their, all their anabolic hormones were low, all their catabolic hormones, catabolic markers, like inflammation, oxidation, all of that was high insulin sensitivity. We, again, was like pre-diabetic. Um, and I really didn't know. I was just like, uh, maybe like shell shock stuff. They talked about the, in you know, different wars, they had shell shock and combat fatigue. Maybe it's that I, but that's a dead end. Cause nobody ever defined that. And so I, I, uh, started treating for adrenal fatigue and, you know, I was just messing around with things that I could try to figure out and doing sort of non-traditional things. And then lo and behold, this Ambien thing pops up. And I start learning about sleep and I learn what Ambien does and what alcohol does. And, you know, seals of one is good, two is better, three is great. And then you take that with a couple of cocktails. And um, and then I, I realized they were just destroying their sleep architecture. So I started telling them, hey, this lowers your growth hormone. It lowers your testosterone. It increases your estradiol. It increases inflammation. It increases. And I, and I we was able to lecture the community on that. And I got them to get off of Ambien by a combination of, you know, supplements that are already available. I just combined a bunch of things that were out on the market, which I did through just, I mean, not no, no special insight. I just did by understanding what sleep was and what happens when you sleep and going through like Cochrane database NIH kind of level of like what supplements have been proven to be effect, efficacious at all with sleep. And then combined a bunch of those got guys off of, uh, you know, got guys off of the Ambien and they're, free testosterone would quadruple, you know, their total testosterone would triple their, you know, uh, their HSCRP would go from, you know, a four or five down to unmeasurable, their insulin sensitivity, you know, their insulin fasting insulin would drop down 75%, uh, you know, just like a, a huge metabolic fix. Wow. Yeah. And I was doing some supplement stuff during the day too. Like I was giving them some DHEA and pregnenolone and some zinc citrate as a anti-aromatase or maybe, an, maybe an actual pharmaceutical anti-aromatase but very, very small interventions and just huge, huge improvements. And then, you know, when I first started telling the leadership that I thought, because they knew, they knew that the seals hormones were off. Like they knew that before I got there. And they knew that Ambien was going out the door. I mean, just so everyone understands, you may have taken an Ambien before, but some of the people I talked to in your field were taking two Ambien, waking up four hours later. Oh taking, yeah, I mean, I, two I think, more Ambien. Yeah, I mean, I think you. I think I actually read that. Read this in an interview you did. You're like, okay, you take the seals, and it's like, okay, well, if the prescription is for one, they're going to take three. Right. You know, like in, in that particular population, they're going to be like, okay, yeah, that's not going to work for me. That's for mortals. Whatever you, yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Like okay. mortals, mortals take one. Yeah. We take three. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you, you you have this, and you're 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 starting to get onto this, and what does leadership say? What, what, what does the organization say? Because theoretically you now have a high performance organization in place, right? That's, and you're now a, the first defunct physician who is the director of performance for Naval Special Warfare. Right. And that you invented that position without even knowing you invented that right. position. So they already knew the testosterone was low and the belief of the leadership was that because of the type of guys we had, uh, you know, everybody knows those kind of guys uh, that they just assumed that we had a bunch of steroid abuse or guys, you know, had, you know, had had abused steroids early in their lives. And now we're suffering the consequences alert later. Again, seals, not doctors. They don't understand that. That doesn't even make any sense. Um, but that that was the going theory. So when I went in their offices and started saying, hey, I think the reason our our guys uh, 
have these hormone deficiencies is because they're using sleep drugs and because of the chaotic sleep schedule. No exaggeration. I literally got laughed out of people's offices. They, they would tell me to go wow. back to medical school and say that was the dumbest thing they'd ever heard in their life, that sleep was affecting their hormones. And I was like, no, really, wow. that's, when, that's when all your hormones are, are adjusted. Like, that's, that's when hormones are made. And, and it took me- 2009. Yeah, it took me a while to convince them. You know, as you know, there was, there was nobody in that space back then uh, yeah. talking about sleep. Uh, you know, there was the book Lights Out, which was primarily about nutrition and sleep, right? A little bit of evolutionary stuff. Right. Uh, but nobody was really thinking of it as a performance tool or, you know, how it affects performance. And so uh, after I got, you know, 100 guys off of Ambien and they started getting, you know, PRs and feeling better at, you know, 35 than they felt at 25 and, uh, you know, all talking to each other about, Hey, my testosterone went from, you know, 250 to 950. And all I did was quit taking Ambien and, you know, uh, and care about my sleep. And then I started getting buy-in and then I know Kelly, you're, you're familiar with the retreats that we did, the pre and post retreats, um, you know, before and after their deployments where we'd bring in guys like Rob Wolf, you know, because he had a cool podcast and, you know, New York times bestselling book. I think we probably brought, brought you into those things I would imagine. And, Grossman and that's how I met Wellborn and like all these guys and uh, you know just because nobody was really talking about sleep I, and I shared the stage with those guys they would say hey you know do you want to come on a podcast do you want to you know invite me to lecture symposiums they were doing and so forth and then I became the sleep guy but I was always just working on performance <laughs> you know and, and that was for my community that was the thing at that time and so um yeah, I just all I basically did was convince them that they needed to change that behavior um, and then come up with a concoction of supplements because I couldn't just take their Ambien away and say, suck it up, you know, uh, but, you know, take away, take away their Ambien, give them something in the place, coach them on some sleep hygiene and, you know, whatever uh, sleep ritualization, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I did a lot of lecturing about what actually happens while you're asleep to convince them like to get the buy in. And then it just kind of took off on its own. And then, you know, like uh, Wellborn had, I, I, I don't know if it, it wasn't the same one I saw yet, but uh, an event he had before he had, I think like a dozen guys from, from red out there. And, uh, and my wife and I did consults on all their blood work. And I would talk to them about sleep and every single one of them, like knew, they knew everything about sleep. Like they knew all the buzzwords. They knew everything about sleep hygiene. They were all practicing good. And I was like, oh, man, like I, like that, that success Night in my world, and man. Day. Like I actually had an impact on the culture and that's it for me. It's like, Hey, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy from then on. Uh, and then of course I got out, I got, I mean, I got the, the part I didn't talk about is I got in a ton of trouble for doing all of that because I was practicing outside of my scope and doing voodoo and witchcraft. Crazy. This is crazy. And, uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter how successful you are. If you aren't, if you aren't following what the Ivy league gray haired dude with wire rim glasses tells you to do, then you're doing the wrong thing. Um, and so, you know, I, I just said, well, I'll, I, I got to get out now cause I kind of sacrificed my career and said, uh, but it changed what I thought about medicine. I didn't want to go back into surgery after that. And I didn't want to go back into general medicine because I didn't believe in that anymore. And I, I've obviously had a much higher passion for improving people's performance and helping people live a higher quality of life instead of, you know, helping people manage diseases. Um, so, you know, that it changed the whole course of my life. And of course, when I left, I left this huge vacuum uh, because they were just going to replace me with Joe Blow doctor who was, gonna, you know, who was going to probably give them Ambien yeah, again. Just do the standard stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and so I just made myself available to the team guys and said, Hey, just, you know, I, I went into private consulting. I said, yeah, I'm going to start the supplement company up. And then well, I, I did a year of brick and mortar. I got, and the seals just harangued me into making that, supplement because you know this is pre-amazon prime they were having to go to every damn store in the city to find out the combination of everything they needed and you know pills and capsules and powders and liquids and it was just a pain so they were like they just harangued me into making a product i made the product purely with the intention of getting a contract with uh, either the seals or socom and just giving you know selling to the community for you know hardly anything above cost you know just so that i could have the community could have it um, and then, you know, Rob jumped in as a partner and then, you know, we launched it at Paleo FX and it turned out to be a great product and 
a good business model. And I still don't have a contract to the SEAL teams 10 years later. I, I was just going <laughs> to take a year off and then go back into brick and mortar. And, you know, here I am 10 years later and I'm still still running that company, still doing primarily virtual, like, you know, consulting. Um, and I manage and, and I'm on the board of a lot of the uh, nonprofit foundations that are helping our community, you know, towards the end of their careers. Awesome. Well, I, I have a couple comments and a couple questions if I could yeah. dive in. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, you know, we don't need to go into this, but operator syndrome syndrome sounds a lot like menopause, by the way. Menopause. Um, and literally, <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. I was like, operator symptom and menopause are the exact same thing. Yep. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, one of the things I thought about as you were talking about the hormone piece and, and as we think about sort of diving into this bigger sleep conversation is what's so interesting about sleep is it, it's like you almost can meet anyone where they are in terms of what they care about and there's something that sleep is going to improve, right? So you're, you're talking, you know, you're primarily working with a SEAL population and you know that you can really change their minds by saying, okay, guys, like if you do this thing I suggest without anything else, like your hormone levels are going to significantly improve. Right. Um, and that really had meaning to them. But if you look really across any population, anyone who's interested Learn in any, a new skill, yeah, any aspect piano. of health, if you want to just be good at your job, if you want to have better body composition, body, I mean, heal. yeah, there's so many ways in which to tackle this based on where people are. And so I thought it was super interesting that really what spoke most to the seals was the hormone piece, but there's so many other pieces of this, all of which I would love to dive in on. Um, but before I do that, I just want to tell you a quick story because, you know, we feel like we've been sort of steeped in this um, sleep, you know, sleep research and sleep information for years now. And we feel like we know a lot about it. We have a chapter about it in our book, Built to Move. Um, but Kelly was just in this last year on a podcast. Um, and we feel like, sorry, just to subtext, we feel like the people in our universe, including people like you and John and everybody. Starting we know, to get it. We're starting to get it. Like, they're like those guys you spoke to who can talk to you about sleep hygiene. And they're like totally different than 2009 right. type. Um but Kelly was on a podcast of a friend of ours that really was like just one sort of like valence outside of the sort of health, fitness, performance community, really a more creative audience. And on that podcast, he just said, hey, everybody needs to get seven or eight hours of sleep. And seven is your benchmark. And I might even pick that up from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and literally this video is going on like four million views on, on his Instagram. Hate. And like 85% of the comments to this post are mad and hateful and disbelieving disbelieving of just that basic piece of information. And so what we learn from that is it's it maybe easy for those of us who are in this to think everybody's kind of getting it, but we still think that a lot of people maybe are starting to hear about it, but there's still a lot of like really basic information that's missing. And so to that point, and because you meant it, or you mentioned it earlier, I would love it if you could just sort of give a, like a rough, rough sort of outline of like what, what the sleep stages are. And then also what it, what happens if you have a poor night sleep? The sleep stages kind of change names uh, over the course of years, but the important thing to, like preface this with um, is that sleep science is very, very, very young, right? It's, it's like 60 years tops, like 60 years ago, they observed that people's eyes moved a lot and they called it rapid eye movement. Like that, like that was, that was the first discovery and sleep. Science. Wow. Only 60 uh, years ago, 60 years ago. Yeah. And that was, and William Dement. So he's still alive. Like the godfather of sleep medicine is still alive. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they've kind of they've kind of changed the names around, but it's still it's very consistent. Right. Um, to your point, people like to everybody wants to object to this eight hours of sleep. Like, OK, <laughs> and you don't want to die either. But <laughs> both of those things are true and there's nothing you can do about it. Like, you're going to die and it takes eight hours to recover from being wait 16 hours. That's period. Like, I don't care if you like it or not. Um, but so like when you first go to sleep. And we can talk about like what leads to sleep after this if you want. But like when you first go to sleep, you're in what we call stage one, which is just kind of uh, that state where things don't seem quite normal, right? Like you, 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 you still hear somebody in the other room or whatever. Um, but, you know, it, it just feels a little different, a little dreamlike. But you're kind of conscious, kind of not conscious. That's stage one. Stage two is like complete sleep. And really what's, what sleep means is that 
your neocortex, which is responsible for all of your sensory and then interpreting all of your sensory and then all of your feedback. So all of your motor and, you know, and thoughts like that part of your brain just kind of shuts off. It's still very active, but you just quit paying attention to your senses, really. So you're, there's a barrier between you and your environment. Obviously, they all still work. That's why you can turn on a light and wake somebody up or make a noise and wake somebody up. But it's just your brain has quit paying attention. And, and part of that is the effect of GABA lowering, uh, you know, lowering the resting membrane potential, increasing how much energy it takes to fire a neuron. And so that you get down into stage two and your senses have essentially turned off. And then you drop down into stages three and four uh, pretty quickly. We kind of lump those together as slow wave sleep cycles or deep sleep cycles. And, um, and then that travels over time, you know, time is on the X axis that travels over time. And then it kind of stair steps out from four to three back through two. And then instead of going into one, again, you shoot past that and go into REM. And then after that stage of REM ends, that's one sleep cycle. And that's 90 to 120 minutes long. Now your first sleep cycle of the night, uh, is about 90% deep sleep, 10% REM. And then every sleep cycle, after that, it's less deep and more REM to where when you wake up in the morning, your last sleep cycle is primarily REM sleep and a little bit of deep sleep. So what happens in deep sleep, you know, the first thing, you know, in order to go to sleep and one of the big, obviously one of the biggest problems people don't sleep well is because they're stressed, i.e. they have high stress hormones, stress hormones have a lot of effects on you. But one of the primary effects is that they're catabolic. That's why we don't want them to be too high. And we need stress hormones that are low enough to allow us to go to sleep. And then when you get into deep sleep, that's the lowest stress hormones you will have at any 24 hour period. Again, those are catabolic hormones. So it's the lowest catabolic state. So by definition, it's the highest anabolic state you have through the entire day. Any point in that 24 hour period, deep sleep is the most anabolic state, highest anabolic hormones, lowest catabolic hormones. And that's when your brain is basically remeasuring everything in your blood and it's determining everything that's controlled by your brain, which is almost every hormone is being controlled. It's being measured. It's going through the hypothalamus is being measured and you're saying, Oh, we need more of that. And if I need more testosterone, then my pituitary gland will secrete luteinizing hormone. And then my testicles will make more testosterone and my brain will measure it again and then determine if it wants to secrete more luteinizing hormone or if it's happy with what I have. And the same thing with growth hormone, the same way, with thyroid, the same thing, everything gets rebalanced during that. And of course, you've, you've probably heard of the glymphatic system, right? So the glymphatic system is where the, the structural cells of the, uh, the structural cells of the brain that, you know, kind of hold the shape of it, they contract about 30%, create these passageways for the cerebral spinal fluid to flow through and wash out waste products. Obviously, like, you know, we're a fractal system, you know, so, uh, you know, the, Every cell in our body is, is you know, is a one thirty trillionth of us, right? It's just, it's a little, it's a little machine that takes in oxygen and takes in nutrients and does way does work and produce waste products, and we're just a bigger version of all that, right? So, every cell in our body has a sleep wake cycle. We can coordinate our sleep to match the sleep wake cycle of all of our cells. The circadian rhythm is you, I know you've heard it called. But we can also be awake when the rest of our cells in our body are like, no, we're doing sleep stuff. And that's why, you know, that's why uh, shift work is so bad for you, because you can change your sleep cycle. You aren't really changing your circadian rhythm. Your cells are still trying to be asleep. They're doing sleep things while you're be while you're doing wake things. So anyway, we um, deep sleep. We flush out the waste products and then we the immune system gets ramped up and it's flushing out waste products, but it's repairing everything. So the, your immune system and your repair system are really the same system, right? So when I work out, when I go to the gym, if I do anything worth doing, I'm weaker when I leave the gym, right? If, if I can do more when I leave the gym than I could do when I got there, I didn't do anything in the gym, right? So I come out of the gym weaker. When I go to sleep that night, I get stronger, right? My body flushes away those waste products. My anabolic hormones go to their peak, highest testosterone, highest growth hormone, all that. And my body starts repairing itself. And, it, and if say like I lifted a bunch of weights and I've damaged my muscle cells, my brain and my body are going to use today as the template for what I need to do tomorrow and say, well, let's repair that muscle, that muscle system, right? Uh, 
you know, whatever is the neuromuscular connection of it, the cell itself, the tendons, ligaments, like everything involved in that system. Let's let's repair that in a way to where he can do tomorrow at least as good, if not better, than he did today, right? So if he does that same thing tomorrow, he'll be he'll be a little stronger, it'll be a little better, and we'll do we'll get less damage. And it's really no more complex than that. And obviously, if I do endurance activity, then we're talking more about you know storage and we're talking about uh mitochondrial efficiency and bio biophysi biophysiology and all that um but my brain uses t t today is the template for what i need to be better at tomorrow and so deep sleep Love is that. all about restoration so i'm repairing basically if i've if i've sprained my ankle if i've stressed a tendon or ligament or my muscles the waste products in my brain waste products anywhere else in my cells and my lymphatics flushing everything out that's deep sleep and then I go into REM sleep, and that's when I start rehearsing everything that I've heard today, everything I've done today, everything I've thought today. I'm going to rehearse it tonight, whether I remember it or not. And I'm going to decide if I think it's important information or not. And I'm either going to make that pathway more durable, or I'm going to prune it to where I'm like, I'm not wasting any energy anymore on what Taylor Swift is doing, right? Because I don't care. Like, that's superfluous information. But maybe this new thing I learned about peptides, I'm going to study, you know, like I'm going to connect that to other information. And once I sleep and I connect everything to different information, the things I already know, now I actually know that I know that concept and I can work with it and I can look at it from different angles. And then I also emotionally categorize anything that's happened. So, you know, if you two have a fight about dishes in the sink, the emotional component of that should be gone about 30 seconds after that arguments over, right? Like that's not a big deal. One of the things we, we know happens with uh, trauma and PTSD type symptoms, people tend to sleep really poorly after they've been through trauma and we emotionally categorize it at night. So if you don't emotionally categorize well during your REM sleep, well, then that trigger of dishes in the sink might be something that's tempting you to get a divorce in a few weeks, you know, because you, you didn't put that in this category. It's like, well, this is just a little small, stupid thing. And so, you know, to your, what, what you were saying earlier, I know is, um, you know, it's the worst sales pitch in the world, but there's, there's literally nothing that there's nothing that sleep doesn't impact. Right. When I, when I first started <laughs> lecturing on this, I said, there are four pillars of health. I said, there's sleep, nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation. I changed that and I said, there's three pillars of health. There's, there's nutrition, exercise, and, and stress mitigation. They sit on the platform of sleep, right? The foundation is sleep <laughs> for those pillars. Because if you don't sleep well, one of the things that's happening during the deep sleep, those hormones, all the hormones I'm talking about, well, ghrelin and leptin are a couple of those, right? So the neuroregulation of my appetite is going to be, it's, tomorrow it's going to be impacted by how I sleep tonight. So if I don't sleep well tonight, my ghrelin and leptin sensitivities and production is going to be altered to where tomorrow when I wake up, I'm going to crave sugar and fat because I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get good sleep. And the only time any mammal on this planet sleep deprives themselves other than humans is when they're starving or if they're being preyed upon. So it's very realistic to assume that we have some evolutionary sort of triggers in our, in our brain too, that make us believe that we, that we're, we're in danger. Like if, if we're, if we're sleep depriving ourselves, it's because something's wrong. And so if you might be going into famine, my fuel partitioning the next day is going to be different too. What is my body going to do with the macros? Well, if they, if my body, if my brain thinks I'm starving, I'm going to store all the fat that I can, and I'm going to crave all the sugar that I can, because I just want to keep the machine going. I want to keep the brain going so that I can go out and forage for food or get shelter or get away from the, the predator or whatever. And so that, um, you know, what I remember, what I emotionally categorize, what I think, how well my body works, how, how I, you know, how I use the fuel, everything is impacted by it. If I don't get good sleep and I didn't repair from, from yesterday, should I even work out tomorrow? Probably not. Like depending on how bad, like how bad the sleep was and how intense my exercise is, I should still be active, but I'm, I shouldn't expect to make athletic gains the next day if I had a really crappy night's sleep, right? Because I, my body's not ready for it. Um, and then the same thing as stress mitigation, you know, it takes, eight, like I said, it takes eight hours to repair, to re, you know, repair and prepare for tomorrow, right? The whole reason I'm going to go to sleep tonight is to repair from today and to prepare for tomorrow. And it takes eight hours. And if I only sleep six hours, I've given up 25%, right? But tomorrow still comes at the same time 
the next day. I still have to do tomorrow. So how do I do it? If I didn't, if I didn't repair and prepare, how am I going to do it? Well, my body's going to compensate by secreting stress hormones and stress hormones are catabolic and they're going to make me feel energetic and they're going to mobilize my glycogen storage and it's going to increase epinephrine and norepinephrine and I'm going to feel alert and I'm going to feel like I can do things fine, but I'm using my body as a fuel source and I'm, I'm degrading myself. In fact, if I could go to sleep and I slept perfectly every night and I could recover 100%, I would wake up exactly the same every day and I would never age because aging essentially is not being able to repair everything that you did to yourself today. If I could repair everything and get everything back to exactly the way it was this morning, tomorrow, I would be exactly the same age tomorrow as I was today and forever. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Momentus. And what we wanted to talk about today is this habit that I've had for years and you as well, thanks to Stacey Sims. But, um, you know, she told us, I don't know, in 2015, that women should eat protein within 30 minutes of exercise. And so it's something that I've been doing pretty religiously, uh, right after I exercise or within 30 minutes of exercise, I just down some protein powder in water in a little shaker cup. Yeah. It, in fact, what, you know, Stacy is really an expert in is move how water and fluids move across different compartments in your body. And one of the things I think is misunderstood is that oftentimes people think, you know, there's a limiting factor to recovery, but ultimately hydration is a huge gatekeeper. You've just exercised pretty intensely. And that limitation of hydration is the thing that's keeping you from kicking into sort of, you know, these, all these anabolic processes. And her point was you put a scoop of, of protein, like whey or whatever you, you can digest in your water. That'll actually help you digest absorb the water more effectively. So you get this sort of double benefit. Right. You get the you, protein bump. You get and, the protein because you're and a, woman. a hydration bump. That's right. And you have a little bit smaller window. And then I have a, uh, a hydration bump, which let's be honest, I always need to work on. And one thing that is so critical about this is that not all proteins are created equal In when it comes to a taste standpoint. And so one of the things that has really helped me is that especially momentous chocolate protein, just add water and shake up and it is ultimately super tasty and very drinkable. I, I told Jeff, the CEO, <laughs> we first got it. I was like, I'm going to run it with warm water and I'm going to stir it with a fork. And if I can't drink that, I'm out. And I was like, it's, yeah, that's it actually the worst, tastes good. the worst yeah, test. Make it, well, I, make I don't it know. Don't you think, I'm sorry. Don't you think dry scooping it would be worse? No, probably better. The other <laughs> thing is well, there's three options here. Quickly, there's always a vegetarian protein because a lot of people don't digest whey very well. Mm -hmm. Plus the whey and the chocolate whey is so good. Grass-fed, German cows. But then there's the recovery, which has a little bit of carbohydrate, which even tastes better. It's lovely. And uh, so if you're looking for, you know, really getting the machinery turned back on quickly, that recovery is the system. So if you want to learn more, go to livemomentous.com slash TRS and use code TRS for 20% off your first purchase. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Element. I want to get right to it. You train in the morning, like That's so many people. And I'm probably hypohydrated when I wake up. I can guarantee you, which means you How haven't you had know? any water for eight or 10 hours. <laughs> Right? But when's the last time you drank? More importantly... Except for sometimes I am so dehydrated, I wake up in the night and have to chug like half a water bottle. Yeah, that, that's so. still... Okay. R regardless, <laughs> what I'm saying is oftentimes you could be getting more out of your training in the morning and feel a little better if you did this thing called salt. So here's what I propose. If you take a half an element and put it in some water and chug that, your workout in the morning is going to be bonkers because you're going to have all the salts on board. Things are going to turn on. You're going to feel better. That water's going to hit differently. You're probably hypohydrated anyway. You're like, I had a coffee. I'm all hydrated up. I know you because that's what I do. And uh, I think that if you commit to starting your morning before you train with some salt, your life will change. Element is that solution. Yeah, and I would just like to say how controversial it is and a lesson we learned from Lisa because I think you can get stuck into this thing that, you know, no matter what, if you open a packet of Element, right, you have, you to, have dump to the whole thing. dump the entire thing in, but it turns out that you can just use wait, wait, you're saying half you're calling it. Lisa a teetotaler, like she's an element toler? She is. And so I just want to say you can just take half a packet yeah, before yeah. you go work out and even just in a glass of water and chug that down and make a really big difference. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. 
Right now, if you order through our link, you can get a free sample pack with all of Element's flavors. Go to drinkelement.com slash TRS. Can we assume, and the way that we think about it and talk about it is exactly the way you do, is that sleep is like a keystone behavior. Like without, you know, from, you know, sleep is, is you know, the, all of the other positive behaviors we have that are health related in our lives all stem from having good sleep. Um, and can we assume that the inverse of all of this is true, which is if you get poor sleep, none of these processes are happening or fewer of them are happening. Um, and, and I guess that leads into my question is, you know, uh, what is the impact of chronic sleep deprivation? And the, the subgroup I'm thinking of here, because this is, I know we will get a comment about this but and we were one of those people, um, is parents of young kids in particular, yeah. you know, um, I think anyone who's had them knows that you go through a phase of chronic sleep deprivation. Um, and how those do you rebuild your sleep and those people get very, um, upset on the internet when all these influencers, including us are like, you've got to prioritize your sleep and optimize your sleep. And, you know, I can understand being in that deep in that, you know, early parenthood phase where you're like, okay, yeah, you can just shut right up with your optimizing sleep conversation. Right. Um, so, so what, what is happening with chronic sleep deprivation and then can we recover? Um, you know, if we go through four or five years of little kids of sleeping, go like, on without like me. It's crap. too late for you. Like you just go through four or five years of your life sleeping like crap. And then, you know, your kids start sleeping and you know, you start to be able to sleep yourself and you know, can you recover or have you done lasting damage to yourself? Right. <laughs> yeah. No, no, nobody wants to hear the, the truth. <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it's like if you tell people how to lose weight, if you tell people how to get in shape, nobody wants to hear it. Like, ah, that's easy for you. You got that, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would, I was smart enough to have three kids two years apart, right? So in the first two years of Ooh, your kid's life, it's really extend it. Yeah. In the first two years of your kid's life, you'll lose six months of sleep. So you lose 25% of your sleep. That's, that's well established. Six months. And so you do it three kids in a row and for six years you lose that. So, right. So you're, um, that's the reason young people are supposed to have kids and old people are right. Because it's harder on you when you're younger, you can recover more, you can recover faster. You know, it has, it has to do, you know, it has a lot to do with gene expression and epigenetics and it has to do with hormones and vascularization and like lots of things that make you the more optimal time and it's easier to recover. Right. In fact, you could really kind of define aging as that, right? It's just it's lack of resources and resiliency, right? When you're when you're twenty, like whatever, you see the guys jumping, flipping their bikes, falling down mountains, and getting up and dusting themselves off, and right. And then when you're fifty, you step off the curb wrong, and you, you know you got a limp for you know three weeks. And so, and then you're eighty, you step off a curb wrong and break your hip, and you die. So, I mean, it, it's really just you know, fewer and fewer resources and less resiliency as you get older. Um, and like I said, the way, the way to maintain those is to sleep as best as you can. Um, so it, yes, it's very unpopular. Um, chronic, chronic sleep deprivation and chronic, uh, prescription drug use, sleep, sleep drug use, um, and shift work are all parallel. They all shorten your lifespan by about 12 to 14 years. Um, and during and so during the last uh, 10 to 15 years of your life, you're about two to three times more likely to have any disease. So there's nothing we can do about that. That's just reality. Um, but again, you know, maybe you're somebody who's going to live to 98. Now you do shift work and you're going to die at 86 and you still lived a long life. So who knows, right? Like it, it does, it doesn't mean you're going to die young, but it does mean you're going to die younger. Like all the research shows that on average. Now, can you, can you get past it? Like if you stay healthy during that time uh, and you do everything else, right. And you're doing shift work, can you recover from that? Or, you know, you're having kids in series and can you recover from that? Well, yeah, you recover, but I, I always give the metaphor of like, um, if I broke my leg, so if I, if I snapped my tib fib doing something and I just said, ah, it's not that bad. I'm just going to limp around on it and it'll eventually heal. Um, versus I, I snap my tib fib and then I go to a doctor and he resets it and they put the bone stimulator on it and a cast and they do everything just right. Either way. Uh, a year from now, I'm not going to have a broken leg anymore. Um, and 
if I didn't do anything about it, maybe my leg's a little crooked, maybe I'm limping, maybe not, maybe I just have a little pain in there. But even if I did everything right and I feel 100%, you'll, you could still do an x-ray and say, oh, you broke your leg right there, right? So there's still some evidence of it. And, and so one of, one of the ways, uh, one of the reasons that we, we know um, how long you need to sleep other than just like objective studies of letting people sleep as long as they need to sleep and giving them time to, to uh, a, what we call uh, sleep adapt. So you put people in a cold, dark room for 14 hours a day and then you let them out 10 hours a day and you put them back in for 14 hours a day. And there's nothing to do in that room except sleep or sit on the bed. Um, they'll sleep about 12 and a half hours when they first start because almost everybody is sleep deprived. And then over the courses of you know, three to six weeks, everybody who continued to do that would eventually be sleeping right around eight hours a day, which means they'd be sitting wow. in a cold, dark room on a bed for six hours a day and not sleeping. Um, so most people are not sleep adapted, but if we do sleep adapt people, that's what we see. Um, but, but when we're, when we're awake, the reason I say it takes those eight hours to recover is like when we're awake, like I said, being awake is essentially a catabolic process. And the longer you're awake, the more, the more the catabolism increases, the lower your stress, lower your sex hormones get your anabolic hormones get. You can measure that throughout the day. The reason you test people's testosterone in the morning it's because their testosterone is a lot higher in the morning. And if you test it at like five or six o'clock in the afternoon, it could be half of that. So your anabolic hormones are diminishing. Your catabolic hormones are going up. Your cortisol peaks around 2 to 3 p.m. and then should come back down. But all of the waste products are building up and all these things need to be flushed out. And one of the things that we know is like the beginnings of a beta amyloid plaque are, you know, they're starting in our brains just from the, just from the inflammation of the waste products. And then if we go to sleep when we should go to sleep and our, we have high sleep quality and all the glymphatics flush everything out, get rid of all those waste products, then that beta amyloid plaque does not seat, right? And, it, and, and if it's there, it's like a few molecules of it. Now, if I stay awake for 48 hours, I've bought some long-term damage. I, I just did. Like there's some beta amyloid plaques now that aren't going to go away when I catch up on my sleep. But when I catch on my sleep, some of that's going to go away and I'm going to repair it. So it's kind of like the broken leg, right? It's like, there's always going to be some evidence of it, but how impactful it is varies from person to person, varies on how quickly you can get back to sleep uh, and the quality and duration of your sleep. So one of the most unpopular things I've ever said is when I lecture first, re first responders who work shift work, I say the ideal thing for you to do is to go home and sleep as long as you possibly can, as soon as you possibly can after your shift. But of course, they're coming home at seven o'clock in the morning when their kids are getting up and getting ready for school. And that's the only time they get to see them. It's the time they get to spend with their wife and then, you know, whatever. They want to go to the gym. <laughs> a lot of them, you know, it's like, yeah, great idea. <laughs> it's like, yeah, go to the gym, tear yourself up. Um, you know, like, and that's their life. And they don't want to do it. But that would, unfortunately, that would be the ideal thing. Um, you can take naps. So like if you're, in a, if you're in a position where you're chronically sleep deprived, um, whether it's from you know, whether it's, whether it's from shift work or being a parent or just a hectic lifestyle or stress or pain or whatever, taking naps helps. Anything you can do to lower your stress hormones during the day helps. Again, there, those are catabolic. So anything that lowers your catabolic hormones, so that's meditation and prayer and certain type of movement therapies, which I would probably know more than I would know about, you know, Tai Chi and those types of things. You can do certain yoga practices, things you can do to relax yourself. Um, lower stress hormones during the day, obviously optimizing your nutrition the best you can, the less processed food, the less, you know, refined sugars and things like that. Like we, you know, the things we know that are toxic to the human body, take the best possible care of yourself that you can to compensate for the fact that one of the major components of health is not, is not being adhered to as, as much as it should. So again, really, really unpopular answer. Um, I, I tell, it's no. I, I tell doctors and new parents and first responders and stuff. I'm like, when you have new kids, if, if you can take turns, I mean, not everybody can depends on lifestyle. You know, there's, there's an ideal way to live. We can do all sorts of metrics and say, Hey, here, here's ideal. And then there's reality. Right. And then in between there we bridge and we, we do what we can with supplements and gadgets and techniques and whatever we do what we can to mitigate in there. But you know, there's a, there's, there's a reality that doesn't allow you to get to ideal. Um, 
but yeah, if you can take, if you can flip flop off, like I said, if you, if you hardly slept that tonight because your kids were up and down all night, the best thing for you to do is get as much sleep as you can, as soon as you possibly can. And if your partner can support that, then that would be the ideal way to recover from that. When people are, let's say they go through periods of dysregulated sleep. I just think about traveling to the East coast. Right. And you know, this last time I traveled to the East coast and Juliet said, Hey, you don't have to speak till one. Why don't you just stay on local time and then don't shift your cycle. Just, you're going to be up until midnight. That's going to be fine. And you're going to sleep until, you know, 9am the next day and do your thing. Mm -hmm. That really was the, one of the first times I had the luxury of doing that and made a big difference. But I still find when I travel, like I went to Europe and came back, went to Europe for a week, for a training camp with the team came back. I had two weeks where I was upside down backwards. Yeah. I'm old. And it felt like it took me 10 days. And so I literally was like, that's almost 30 days of being really, literally disrupted 20 to 30 days. How could a person, you know, without, you know, opening up this panacea of like, hey, there's gotta be a pill. Cause the thing is I need to do sleep and get back on it and not interrupt that. Is there a, something that people can do to start to jumpstart that process a little bit, you know, yeah, like, and, and because also, like melatonin in Europe, you can't buy melatonin anywhere, but in the United States, you can just get it at seven 11 well, and kids, kids can't. Right. Well, and also what do you do? Because I know you also travel a lot because you speak and you know, are, are, you know, like I would love to know, like, what should we do and what do you do? Yeah. Well, um, again, this is one of those unpopular reality based conversations. Uh, Every, every every time zone you change, so every one hour you fly over takes, um, depending on if you're going east, west to east or east to west, um, <clears throat> takes a day to a day and a half to recover from. So if you if you go across eight time zones, if you want to re re-entrain your sleep with your body circadian rhythm in that environment, it's going to take you a minimum of eight days. It's going to take eight to 12 days to get back on that schedule. And then when you go back home, it's going to do exactly the opposite. Now we can, we can adjust that a little bit. Um, and it's not, it's not rocket surgery. <clears throat> um, if you just think about like, you know, how did we evolve to sleep, right? We evolved the blue light goes out of the sky because the sun goes down the sky's blue. We have neurons in our eyes that sense blue light have nothing to do with vision. Once the blue light goes down, that triggers hundreds of chemical reactions in our brain. And of course, the first thing, the primary initiator of all that is the secretion of the hormone melatonin, which everybody's heard of. That initiates a bunch of cascades. Our brains change. And about three hours after the sun goes down, we feel like sleeping. And then when we wake up in the morning, we have light in the sky and that bright light increases our stress hormones and brings us up faster. The nighttime is allowing everything to go down. My stress hormones are going down in preparation for going to sleep. My the blue light's gone. I can't see. Melatonin is being secreted. I can't see very well because I'm not an animal that can see well at night, so I don't do much. I, my activity lowers. My heat source went away, so I get colder. Those are the three things that make you feel like sleeping. And then when I wake up in the morning, activity and light is what makes me feel awake. It makes me feel like going after my day. And nowadays, caffeine, obviously, or cocaine or whatever you do. Um, so the things that you can do to adjust that is just, it's very intuitive, right? It's like, all right, well, if I'm, if I'm flying from here to there and bedtime's going to be a lot later, then I need to make my day longer. I do that with bright lights, right? I put some bright lights in my eyes later in the day or I do a lot of ex exercise and activity later in the day, and that will make my day a little longer and it'll push back when I feel like going to sleep because I'm actually elevating my stress hormones a little bit, give myself a little elevation. The opposite is true. If I want to pull bedtime closer to me, first thing in the morning, I make sure I get lots, I get my high intensity, I, and I mean relative, you don't have to do like actual hit, but you know what I mean? Like you, I do my high intensity movement activity exercise and I get my bright light in the morning. And that, that makes, that pulls my bedtime closer to me because my brain's like, Oh, it's later in the day than it should be. I got all this you know, bright light like right now. And so you pull, you can push and pull your bedtime that way. And then you can prepare for it. 
um, you know, coming up, you know, especially like if I'm going somewhere where my bedtime is going to be earlier than I feel like going to sleep, right? I can, I can start a few days before like taking melatonin, you know, like when, when I'm going to be in California. So I'm t- like, you know, whatever, if I go to San Diego, it's two hours, it's two hours earlier. I'm not going to feel like going to sleep. No, I did that wrong. Whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> going the other way. Uh, so I, if, if I, if I want to be able to go to sleep earlier, I take melatonin say like an hour or two before my actual bedtime here and not a lot, like a milligram or something is all you need because all you're doing is kind of reinitiating that cascade and getting your body and trained to do that a little earlier in the night. And now when I go to where my bedtime is earlier, I can, you know, it, it'll, it'll be a little bit easier, but we're talking very small. Everything I just said, maybe it's a 15 to 20% difference. So it's, it's still roughly a day to recover. You know, maybe you've gotten it down to 20 hours. Right. But there's little, there's little tweaks you can make. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned this a little bit and I'm, I actually asked some people before speaking to you, what questions do you have? And the most common question was, I think this is going to be a multi-part question, but I think the bigger overarching question is, you know, what supplements do actually work or are based on evidence show to help with sleep? And should I take them all the time? And and yeah, should I take them all the time? The melatonin example was really interesting. If you could you know, elaborate on melatonin, but the other ones are, I think a lot of people know magnesium is helpful, but are confused because there's like 10 different kinds of magnesium. So which one should they take? Which one is the most effective? You know, people asked about ashwagandha, tart cherry juice, uh, melatonin. Um, those are the ones that came up in the questions I, I was, you know, when people asked me to ask you, um, but you know, if you could talk about those and any others and, and, and maybe even like give a weight to like how much research, you know, shows that these things are effective, right? Like I think, you know, maybe magnesium we know outweighs tart cherry juice from a research research perspective, but both might be helpful. I, I don't know, just, you know, some kind of, yeah. you know, a little masterclass on, on sleep supplements. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> and we will point everyone towards your resources because you yes, do have and, a lot and of resources And you obviously there, so. have a lot of resources here, but you know, right. Um, a mi- mini masterclass. <laughs> It, it it's it's not intentional, but by design, it, this will be a, se- a self serving uh, conversation. <laughs> um, so w- you know, w- when I decided, and, and I'll I'll stick to my lane, right? So that I'm I know there are things and you know say traditional Chinese medicine and you know uh, things people can do with herbs and so forth that I don't I don't know about, right? I, that's not my field of expertise. I'm not well trained in that. I'm just I'm just working with normal biochemistry. So I don't know exactly how all those, those things work. So when I, when I was trying to help the seals get off of Ambien, I just said, well, you know, like I said, I went to the, these, you know, just very conservative, no, normal mainstream medical sites, what supplements tend to work with sleep. And, you know, it, it seemed like a mishmash of just random crap to me at first, but then I was, uh, after I learned, after I knew enough about sleep, I'm like, oh, okay, well, that makes perfect sense. So, so it, you know, really quickly, right? Everybody's heard of the, the tryptophan coma, right? With Thanksgiving. Tryptophan is just an amino acid that's in meat. Not any more in Turkey than any other meat, but, you know, it's the overeating really that's getting to us. Um, and so uh, tryptophan becomes 5-hydroxytryptophan, especially in the brain, but anywhere in the body, uh, in, in the gut and the brain primarily. But um, so we'll talk about it in the brain. So tryptophan becomes 5-hydroxytryptophan. And then with the assistance, the cofactors of vitamin D3 and magnesium, 5-hydroxytryptophan can become serotonin. Of course, serotonin is mood elevating and goal directing and all the other stuff. But serotonin converts to melatonin when we need melatonin, obviously. But of course, we're making melatonin and storing it in the pineal gland kind of all day, and then we're secreting it at night. Um, and then one of the, as I was saying earlier, one of the first things that happen with the, with the, um, with the initiation of melatonin, one of the first things that happened is the release of the neuropeptide GABA, capital G-A-B-A, gamma amino butyric acid. And that's a neuropeptide that go basically saturates all of your, all of your cells in your neocortex. And it, and it lowers the resting potential of that, you know, so you can just think about it as electricity or vibration. There's a little bit of energy in every cell. And if you put in enough to raise a threshold, then you get like a snap or spark, right? Like a spark plug. You put in enough energy, you can get a big burst of activity from that neuron. 
And GABA makes it harder for you to do that. And that slows down our neocortex and that makes us pay less attention to our environment and pay less attention to our senses. And it makes us interact with our environment less. And then we start feeling sleepy. And then once we go to sleep, man, there's a, like, there's a million things going on and it changes all night. Cause like we were talking about this, this, the different stages of sleep where well, your brain chemistry is different in all of those stages and it's changing and it's the brain chemistry that's changing, that's causing you to shift into the next phase, right? So it, there's nothing static. The brain is equally as active at night as it is, like when you're asleep, your brain's just as active, if not more active as it is when you're awake. It's just totally different patterns. And so your brain's doing its thing to repair itself and flush out waste products and consolidate memories and make things more durable and prune things off. And it's doing all this with these changes of biochemistry, which is far too complex to try to supplement through because what at what point are you supplementing with for like an hour like yeah, i'm just putting hour. an ice pack on my head it's totally yeah. going to change <laughs> right right <laughs> right um and so um you know all like all that's in my sleep supplement is are those things right so melatonin i'm very cautious with because melatonin is a hormone and i don't want to take over the production of any hormone because then i take a chance of my brain not producing melatonin or not producing enough melatonin yeah. Um, which we haven't we haven't ever validated that yet. I don't know why. I say we. I'm not part of the research. I don't know why that hasn't been validated yet. If it's if it's not true, it's the only hormone that that's true for. Um, but what what has been validated is that you will downregulate your receptors if you take too much melatonin. So from the time the sun goes down until the time the sun wakes, until the sun comes back up, so that 10 to 12 hour period, your brain will will secrete about six micrograms of melatonin throughout the entire night, right? So if you take a one milligram capsule, you wouldn't absorb all of it, but just, you know, for conversational sake, if you took a one milligram capsule and you have all of that in your brain at once, well, that's, that's more than twice as much as your brain's gonna make over 10 hours. So you have this big spike in it and that's gonna have different effects. You know, and I was saying earlier, like, uh, the sleep drugs are GABA analogs, right? So they bind the same GABA receptor that, that GABA does, but benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax, those have a hundred times more effect on that receptor than GABA. And the Z drugs have a thousand times more effect on that receptor than GABA. So wow. that's how the pharmaceutical wow. industry works. And so all it does is dissociate your brain and, you know, it kind of turns your brain off, but it doesn't, initiate any of those other cascades. It doesn't do anything else that's supposed to ha has nothing to do with melatonin. It has nothing to do with the normal changes. So you just kind of crash the brain. Um, and so, you know, my, my product, I basically just figured out, well, I want to give a little dusting to initiate because nobody spends three hours getting ready for sleep, right? It just doesn't happen. Nobody, yeah. nobody, that's not realistic. You can wear blue blocking glasses and turn down the lighting intensity and whatever you like, you can, quasi get ready for sleep, but nobody really does that. So all I'm Not trying much. to do is say, like, what would be sort of the nutritional chemistry changes in your brain? Because that's all I know about. I, you know, um, I, I don't know pharmacology, I don't know how to create pharmacological agents. So nutritionally, like, what are the new what, what's the different sort of biochemistry that would go in your brain? And what would you need? Well, you would need all those things I just talked about. Um, so that pathways in there. And really with the tryptophan of vitamin D3 and magnesium and the 5-HTP, I just figured out with the seals, it was just a total guesswork. You know, we started with whatever is on the internet and then we just kind of figured it out. The melatonin, I do about two micrograms, hoping that you absorb half of that. You get one microgram and you get, you know, an initiation. Your brain still has to do all the work. Um, um, L-theanine uh, and your L-theanine impacts or it, it affects, it, it basically makes what GABA you have more powerful. It aids in the function of GABA getting into the cells. It makes it easier for GABA to get into cells. Um, so my product has tryptophan, 5-hydroxy tryptophan, vitamin D3, magnesium, melatonin, GABA, L-theanine. And then just recently I added phosphatidylserine because that's a uh, again, a normal biochemical component that's in your body. Um, but research uh, for things like lactate threshold and uh, VO2 max and so forth, they, they've shown that um, phosphatidylserine will lower your cortisol levels during intense activity. So um, 
it makes sense that it would lower your cortisol levels, period. Um, it wouldn't be specific to that. Um, and so I've been using that in my product. Uh, and if I thought there was something more powerful or something that worked that I wasn't in there, I'd just put it in there. So I like I, I honestly think that everything in my product is what actually works. The magnesium question, um, I think, is is you know, that battle has been going on for a long time. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of supplements have to do about the molecule size. Um, so when you're when you're taking magnesium, you're not just taking like, you know, an atom of, of, of magnesium, like you're, you're taking a molecule and it has to be bound to something. And so the bigger the thing it's bound to, the harder it is to get it into the brain or the harder it might be to just absorb through the gut. Um, and Stanford came out with uh, the ma uh, magnesium L3 and 8, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. I, I remember meeting with them when they first came out with it. They call it mag team now. Um, and they they proved that, and they were using it for cognitive uh, cognitive decline associated age associated neurological decline essentially. Um, and I, I met with their with their people, and they they had this very clear evidence that theirs got past the blood brain barrier better than any kind of magnesium on the on the on the market, which was really unfortunate because they patented it because they're Stanford and they cost ten times more than any other type of magnesium. But then somebody was smart enough to go, well, it's just an amino acid attached to magnesium. So let's try it with other amino acids. So now basically all the amino acid bound magnesiums are pretty comparable. Um, there might be a five, 10 percent difference to absorption, but that's about it. Mm. That's really useful. That's, yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for that. That was really helpful. So, you know, uh, one of the things I know is that cognitive behavioral therapy is as effective in treating insomnia as like Ambien or, or whatever, more, in fact, maybe more, more so. Um, but what's so interesting, and I think the challenge we all have in what we do is the behavior piece, which is actually getting people to do the things that they often know are good for them. Right. <laughs> and I think sleep is no different. I mean, even in you know, the- We really started to yeah. organize our whole day around sleep when we cut off caffeine, yeah developing sleep pressure through walking. I mean, we really yeah, are just like, it, we feel like sleep is a whole day's game. And yeah. and even in our book, we have a, you know, a lot of very standard recommendations about how to think about sleep and get better sleep, which are all effectively cognitive behavioral therapy. But of course, people actually have to do those things. And often we talk to them and they say, oh yeah, I'm doing that. And when I really dig deep, they're like doing one of the things, like they've incorporated an eye mask and they aren't doing the other nine things. Right. Or um, so what have you found? I mean, you know, obviously this, this is the question in everything we do is how to get people to do the things they know they should be doing. Right. But what have you found does work or motivates people to change their behavior around sleep? Is it what we talked about earlier, which is, you know, letting them know how important it is based on something they care about, whether that's hormones or performance or, you know, you name it, body composition. Um, what have you found really works to actually get people to change their behavior? And, and sub question to that, because I wanted to know, are wearables, do wearables make mm. a difference in this yeah. behavior question? Yeah. So, um, the way, I, the way I've always phrased this, um, uh, you know, even e I, we could have we could have spent the entire podcast talking about uh, all the detrimental effects of not sleeping well, right? Like that's that's an easy conversation. I could talk for two hours on that. Um, but what I usually say is, um, any anybody who you who you're trying to convince or trying to work with, you know, get them to write down three or four things that they care about. And I don't care what it is. It could be making money, raising their kids, being faster, being stronger, being smarter, being good with chicks, whatever, like whatever you want to do. And then just go on something like PubMed, you know, some or Google Scholar and you put in sleep and whatever you care about. And then you just read until you're petrified and you realize how important it is. <laughs> kind of all you can do. Uh, because unlike nutritional science and unlike exercise science like it is very consistent sleep can sleep science is very consistent like you're gonna die you're gonna die younger you're gonna be sicker you're gonna be colder you're, like, you're gonna be fatter you're gonna be dumber like it's there there's nothing there's no controversy you know it's not, not like oh i can 
I can put butter in my coffee. I don't have to sleep. No, nope, that that's not going to work. So, um, read until you're petrified and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm really motivated and it can be positive things too. It's like, um, so when, you know, when I'm working with my private clients, um, I get to know them really well and I know, and we set goals and I say, okay, well, if you want to get your goals, here's how we do it. And this is why it's important. You know, when I'm working with the seals, you know, it's just a part of their overall energy source. And I talk to them about physical performance, but it's whatever, whatever they'll do, uh, you know, whatever, whatever motivates them. And you just have to convince them. It's the worst sales pitch in the world, but it's true. Every single thing you want to get better at is, is largely determined by how well you sleep. If you don't sleep well, you aren't getting better at things, period. Like I, it just, it doesn't happen. You can, you can think it all you want to. One of, you know, one of the most famous studies with this is, um, when you sleep adapt somebody, like I said, you know, that those 12 hours, let them sleep 12 and a half hours a day until they're sleeping eight hours a day. And now they're on schedule. You know, they're getting as much sleep as they need. Or this is true for people who basically go to sleep at the same time every night, and wake up every morning without an alarm clock, feeling good. And it's like very consistent. Then, you know, they're sleep adapted too. But you take someone like that, you bring them in in the morning and you test them on a skill. It could be something they already do or you could be something you teach them. Doesn't matter. You test their performance. And then you say, come back tonight and I want to see how you do tonight. So you come back at seven o'clock tonight and you retest on it and you'll do worse than you did in the morning. And then you say, okay, I'm going to send you home to sleep tonight. But instead of sleeping eight hours tonight, you're only going to sleep six hours. And then you come in the next morning. Forget about that retesting in the night. That's another story. But say, I test you. I teach you something or test you in the morning today. Tonight, you're only going to sleep six hours. Tomorrow morning, you come in, you're, you'll do worse than you did the day before. And if I ask you how you think you did, you'll say, I did worse. I, I felt tired. I didn't get enough sleep. And then the next day, you'll say the same thing. And the third day, you might say the same thing. But by the fourth day, 100% of people will say, I completely adapted to this new routine. And I did as well as I've ever done. And you can show them the data and go, no, it's still going down at the same rate. And they will argue with you and say, no, no, you're wrong. I know how I feel. So our subject, wow. our yeah, subject, that's that Instagram post. What an advantage. Yeah, I mean, that that's that brain tricking itself. I mean, that's why people went temporarily insane on that Instagram right. post because they're like, I've adapted to six hours and I'm slaying at life. Right. When really they're not. And there's these, there's these stories <laughs> of the super sleeper gene and all that. And there, there's this myth going around that certain people don't need as much sleep. That's not true. What the super sleeper gene means is that you you aren't as negatively impacted as other people when you don't sleep enough. You still basically need eight hours of sleep. That's all it is. It's no different than saying if you have everybody in the world run 10 miles, who like how much are you going to suffer? Well, it depends on how like how good a shape you are and how, how often you run and how big you are. Like, right, there's a million variables. I've got a, n a new question okay. for you, though. That was awesome. Um, and, you know, we're, we'll let you go here in a moment. But um, is it, should it be attendant upon parents, especially of young kids, to really teach their kids how to sleep? Like in your work with people, did you notice? Um, it's a disaster. Did, yeah. I mean, did you sleep notice, like, you know, certain of the SEALs or patients who come work with you developed early on in life really high quality sleep routines and were faring better? And the opposite being true for who weren't the kids who weren't really taught how to sleep well as kids. I mean, do you see that at, in the adult population? And, and, and the reason I'm asking is, you know, should parents be hyper motivated? to prioritize and teach kids how to sleep when they're little. The reason you're asking is hashtag asking for a friend. No, I'm just, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's too late for us. If we mess that up, it's over. But I, you know, for, for those who might be able to now teach their kids. <laughs> yes. So, um, fortunately for everybody, um, your sleep, uh, sleep behaviors early in life don't really dictate your ability to sleep later in life. Mm. Once you change your value system, at least in my experience, I haven't seen that and I haven't seen any literature that suggests that's true. Um, but unfortunately, the unfortunate reality for us is that, you know, if your kids go to public schools, they're drastically sleep deprived. You know, their kids do need more sleep than adults um, all through childhood. Adolescence, there's a phase shift. So it, it's not just because your kids are pricks uh, like they're, they're, you know, they're they're hormonally becoming pricks and that's why they're behaving that way and there's a shift and it makes them want to go to sleep two to three hours later 
which means they need to wake up two to three hours later. And during adolescence, during that pubescence time, they need about 12 to 14 hours of sleep. And they're getting seven or eight, probably, right? So they're getting about half as much sleep as they need. And it's and they're and it's later in the night. Um, you know, characteristically, it's not it's not a straight line, but characteristically, the later you go to sleep, the more deep sleep you lose. And the earlier you wake up, the more REM sleep you lose. So you know, our kids are staying up late. The school system is set up that way. You know, if they go to school and they have an after school activity and they have to do their homework, if they want to kind of have any life, they stay up late. Um, the only thing that I've really seen that's uh, research wise, that's super impactful for ke- getting your kids to sleep better, because let's face it, it if somebody doesn't want to sleep, there's nothing you can do, right? Uh, you, I mean, you can, what are you going to do? I mean, chain them too bad. They're still not going to sleep if they don't want to sleep. Uh, but the one thing that, that the research does bear out is, of course, getting electronics out of their room. So don't I, I did that with my kids and it was exceedingly unpopular. I, I mean, I still <laughs> all my kids are adults now and I still get crap to this day about how I was like Amish or something because I made them I made them keep their I they didn't they couldn't have their cell phones in their room. Like at nine o'clock, you put every there's like a caddy where everybody's cell phone charged. Like everybody's cell phone goes in the kitchen and they didn't have televisions in the room. They couldn't have their computers in the room. And of course they pissed and moaned and hated it. But that's about the only thing that I know that will really help a kid sleep. But I want to back up to what we were talking about a little earlier uh, when I lost my train of thought. Um, The most powerful thing that I do is get is help people sleep with by getting the stress out of their sleep. The reason adults don't sleep is because they're too stressed. Um, and then when you don't get enough sleep, like I said earlier, your body compensates by producing more stress hormones. And now you can't sleep because your stress hormones are high. And then you don't sleep well because your stress hormones are high. So your stress hormones go higher. Um, and so that's a pro- self-propagating downward spiral. And, you know, I obviously, like I do everything performance wise. So I'm working with nutrition and exercise programming and I'm working with stress mitigation and I'm working, I do hormones and peptides and hyperbarics and psychedelics and everything, anything you need, anything that works, we're going to work with them. As I said earlier, nobody spends enough time getting ready for sleep. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm. I'm going to teach you how to do that. Nobody's going to do that. It's just not reality. But if we can get an hour, if we can get you to prepare an hour before you go to bed, you decrease the blue light, you decrease your activity, your intensity. If you're going to watch television, okay. Don't watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something like that. Don't watch creepy Silence in the Lamb stuff. You watch something calming, or something you know that you don't even think about. If you need that, Uh, but ideally you decrease the light in your eyes, decrease your activity, your engagement with the world, and you lower your body temperature. You can do that by turning your AC down. You can do that by taking a shower. You can do it by taking a bath. You don't have to take a cold shower or cold bath. Like your body temperature is 98 degrees. Nobody takes 98 degree baths. Nobody takes 98 degree showers. You take like an 80 something degree shower, 80 something degree bath. You'll lower your body temperature a little. Um, And, you know, you just keep your mind slow and your activity slow. You can't work on your computer till 9.59 and get in bed at 10 o'clock and fall asleep. So you set an alarm clock an hour before it's time to go to bed. After the alarm clock goes off, you get ready for bed. You get into bed at 10 o'clock, say. um, And then you put your alarm clock in your drawer, under your bed, whatever. You can't see a clock if your, your phone cover it with a towel, whatever you have to do to where you can't see the clock. There's an alarm clock that's going to wake you up in the morning, whether you think you need it or not, you set that alarm clock because you don't want to worry about it. Okay. And then you have a list that you've made earlier in the day and it's next to your bed. And on one side, it's your to-do list. And a to-do list just means you write down everything that you need to do as far out into the future as you're likely to worry. Right. Um, that's totally different for everybody. For me, that's tomorrow. Um, for my wife, it's six months. Like to do list one side. On the other side, just to to worry list. That shit you don't have any control over, but you don't want to forget to worry about it because if you start thinking about it at night, you're going to worry about it. And here's the trick: once you lay down at ten o'clock and you put your phone away, you put all you put away your sense of any. Hopefully, your bedroom's darkened out and there's no real way for you to know what time it is. And you say, I'm going to lay in this bed until my alarm clock goes off in the morning. The best thing that I can do is sleep. The next best thing that I can do is meditate. 
meditate, pray, progressive muscle relaxation, diurnal beats, whatever, whatever it is that you can do to kind of lower your stress hormones, get you close to a meditative state. A really good meditator can get to a theta brainwave state, which is equivalent with stage three sleep. So you're not getting 100% of the benefit of sleep, but you're getting 70 to 80% of the benefits of sleep. So you say, I'm going to lay in bed and I'm going to sleep and meditate until the alarm clock goes off. And then you don't care. You fall asleep whenever you fall asleep. If anything pops in your mind that you start thinking about, you're like, that's on the list. The best I'll ever be at handling my list is in the morning after I've had a good night's sleep. I don't no sense in handling it while I'm impaired right now. Like I'm not at my best. I'm going to, this is the time to repair and prepare for tomorrow. So I'm going to lay in my bed and meditate and sleep. If I wake up, I need to go to the bathroom. I go to the bathroom. I come back. I lay in bed. I don't know what time it is. I don't know when my alarm clock is going to go off. So I'm just going to lay in bed and meditate. And if my alarm clock goes off 15 minutes later or 45 minutes later and I'm still awake, great. I got seven hours and 15 minutes of sleep. I got 45 minutes of meditation. I'm ready to go. If my alarm clock is not going to go off for three or four more hours, I'm going to fall back asleep. And if I'm not worried about it, I won't even know when I fell back asleep. And all I'll say is like every night I'm getting the best rest I can possibly get because I'm getting a combination of sleep and then the next best thing to sleep that I can achieve, which is some sort of deep, deep, deep relaxation. And the more you do this, the better you'll get at it. And then at some point of this, it's very mechanical at first, but at some point there'll be a little, you know, you'll click and you'll get it. And this is where the CBT comes in and you'll be like, oh, I really believe that now. I really believe that this this eight hours is only for being in bed and sleeping and relaxing. That's it. And I'm not going to worry about my list. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm not going to worry about whether or not I'm sleeping. And once you once you get it, like once it clicks in, you'll never have insomnia again. But you know that the mechanical part's easy, and it takes you know anywhere from like two to kind of four weeks for that little click tick, and you go, oh okay. And then you'll then it's just then if you have insomnia, it's by choice. Yeah. I mean, I love that because I've had a couple of real stress phases and had insomnia mm-hmm. and it is the worst. Right. Um, and just, I, I feel like that is so valuable to people who struggle with insomnia to be given like an alternative. And the alternative is, man, you can rest and meditate and, right. you know, and not stress about the fact that you're resting and meditating because you're <laughs> still getting some of the benefits that you would get from sleeping. And, you know, I think that's often what people need is like an alternative reality, right? Like it's going to be okay. And I can do the next best thing to sleeping, which is rest. And I'm going to survive. It's going to be okay. And, you know, I can deal with all these other things tomorrow. I don't know what you're talking about. What happened to Navy SEAL, like Kirk Parsley? I mean, that guy is dead. You're like, no wonder you got kicked out of the military. Like, you're a radical. Like, s- prepare for sleep. Write down your worries. Yeah, uh, really. Uh, I, it's it's well, so will, fun to see this yeah. trajectory where you you're like, hey, this thing isn't working, and now we're deep into the behavior of trying to to make sense of it. It's really. Man, yeah, and we you're, we, my, we, uh, you're just like you're my been my go to, my favorite person who's talked about sleep, and and a lot of people talk about sleep, but you just have resonated with me so much over the years. Well, that, and we'll definitely link to your worksheet in our show notes because I'm sure people will be really curious to try that out. Yeah, and, and that's that's probably the the only place where I kind of I kind of steer away from the the traditional sleep medicine because they'll tell you, oh, get out of bed because you don't want to associate your bed with worry. And so mm-hmm. you get out of bed and you go read a book, you go watch television, you go stretch, whatever. And then you're like, whatever you do, you, you distract yourself with a book. And then as soon as you close the book, you're going to start worrying again. And you're going to be thinking about how long you've been awake and how long you've been reading. And oh man, I better get back to sleep. And if I only get three more hours, if I go back to sleep now, and that's unavoidable, unless you just go, Hey, time in bed is my goal. It's eight hours in bed. That's it. And like, I'm either sleeping or meditating. That's it. And I, and I can't be wrong because if I can't sleep for eight hours, I'm going to sleep as much as I can and meditate the rest of the time because that's still restorative and it's still keeping my stress hormones low and it's still allowing me to repair and prepare for tomorrow. Kirk, love that. where can people find all things your brain sleep? My website's the best way because I don't really know my social media stuff. I don't, actually, my social media is kind of more my... My, uh, my personal stuff anyway. So doc, doc parsley, D O C short for doctor doc parsley, like the herb.com that has, you know, lectures, whatever the Ted talk, the books, the eBooks, the, uh, the, you know, the worksheet I talked about, there's some blogs on there, links to podcasts. 
Um, yeah, that's that's the best source. All my social stuff is linked to that if you want to follow me by it. It's not something I really do like a lot of. Well, we didn't even get a chance to talk about our friend, uh, John Wellborn, but we'll have to have you back. Uh, Dr. Parsley, thank you so much for spending time with it. It is just, I, I cannot thank you enough for being the first wave in the pool to say, hey, I think we need to, to look at this. And uh, man, it's been so informative and so seminal in me handling chronic pain, handling injury prevention, managing performance. I really just, I, we just owe you so much. So thank you so much for your well, time. Thank you, man. Thank I, you. I really, I really appreciate the kind words and I appreciate the opportunity to spew my dogma. Thank you for listening to the Ready State Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, check out all our episodes here or at thereadystate.com. And be sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes to help others find our show. Check us out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ready State. Until next time, cheers, everyone. You've got it.